Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific Time. Welcome, everybody, to the Tuesday Night Keystone Big Book Workshop. I am Rob K., Recovered Alcoholic, sobriety date October 11, 2013. This workshop is facilitated by Tony R. and Katie J. We will keep everybody muted during the workshop except for the facilitator. Please note that we'll be taking questions after the meeting, so please write them down so you do not forget. Any inappropriate conduct will not be tolerated, and you will be removed by one of the co-hosts. Have a great meeting. How we open this meeting is with the set-aside prayer. What makes a great meeting? Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my disease, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Tony, it's all yours, brother. Right on. We're going we're gonna to have some... Fu- oh, there we go. Going to unmute. Welcome to Zoom, eh? Here we go. That was my best talk so far. Sorry you guys missed that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a recovered alcoholic. My name's Tony. Sobriety Day is April 8, 1989. Um, uh, I may not impress you, but it impresses the shit out of me every time I say that, man. It's pretty amazing stuff that any of us, uh, any of us get any kind of time based on the illness that, that we used to suffer from and we found an answer to. So, tonight's meeting is going to be a little different than most. If you're kind of new, just kind of relax and kind of go through it. Um, highlight some stuff. Keep it on a piece of paper. Visit... I'm not about arguing about this stuff. It's, we're just going to stick with what the book says. Because anybody ever go into chat rooms online? You know, the, those discussion meetings? Holy smokes. Long-time members. It's just like mind-boggling where, where we get our information from. So <clears throat> are we agreed kind of somewhat, uh, hopefully, that the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is the basic text of the fellowship? And the fellowship took its name from the book. And this is the collective experience of those that put this thing together. So I'm going to do this from two perspectives tonight. One, as a person who's gone through this and who has recovered and, and, and our primary purpose and our sole responsibility. And then secondly, as we go along, as a person new to this thing. Right? So what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about our responsibility of those who have went through this. So you can imagine before the fellowship got a hold of a lot of these people, a lot of ideas have infiltrated the fellowship that are not book-based. I know some people find that surprising. And and they sound good, and, and they're great sound bites, and, and a lot of people use them. And <clears throat> what happens is new people, and people have been around a while, actually thinks it's in the message of Alcoholics Anonymous and what happens is, so when you try to get clarity around that, it, it upsets a lot of people, right? So what we want to do is just stick with the book. So if we go to page 89, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about why the book makes a clear distinction between the obsession and the malady, which is the second symptom in alcoholism, right? We're going to go exactly what the book says, not my interpretation, not my opinion, Right or my ideas, and and we don't use the, the that term in our big in our big book study as uh, what's that thing uh, um, semantics. We don't use that, right? Because you want to know somebody who's losing an argument. That's what they say. Oh, it's semantics. Oh no. Well, let's see what the book says. Right? <laughs> let's see what the book says. So, I've gone through this process with a sponsor. Hopefully. Somebody's guided me through this, right? I have somewhat of an experience. By the time I get to page 88, I'm practicing step 11. I'm hopefully starting to look at the idea of working with people. I started working on my step nines because I have a basis of a relationship or trust with something greater than me, which is the whole purpose of the book, right? Where, I, or, where I'm no longer self-reliant. I, I'm now in relationship or counsel with something greater than myself. Remember Bill's story when he went through this process? He, he was to check his newfound thinking with his new consciousness within, his new God. He was in counsel with something other than himself. Most of us are in just in counsel with ourselves. Anybody agree with that? How many people spent all day <laughs> thinking, talking to themselves? Right? That's what they mean there is that counsel with self, right? 
but we'll get that. We don't get enough time to get into that part of it. So, we just finished eighty eight. Now they're giving us an idea here on page eighty nine about carrying this message. So what they're saying is this change is fundamentally started, and it's going to get confirmation as we go along. You hear a lot of people say, "Oh, the step ten promises happen in step ten. Well, actually, step ten is a summary of, of the whole thing. Right, they're saying somewhere along the line when engaging with this thing, you should experience the psychic change or spiritual experience where the problem's removed. Right? They talk about if we're painstaking about this phase of our development, the idea of the promises move into the thought, right, of step ten. Right? This thought brings us to step ten. What's the thought of these new ideas that they're presenting? And step eleven is how to confirm this or or how to make it happen these ideas that they're presenting in step 10 which is a whole different meeting altogether so let's go with here starting with working with others top of the page practical experience okay my name is katie i'm an alcoholic katie chapter seven working with others practical experience shows that nothing so will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics and if you work with other alcoholics you understand what intensive means now you'll understand what everybody else has been experiencing working with you right you don't see it but when you start working with people like you you go oh my god <laughs> can't believe these people we go yeah welcome to you right so so uh, thank god we can't see us the way other people see us isn't that true right as we go along we get to see this in new people we go oh my god this person's nuts this is yeah they're a direct reflection of you <laughs> okay so go ahead this, uh, it works when other activities fail. So notice it didn't say go home and work on yourself. Yeah. Right? It says, it says the key to this recipe is what Bill talked about was once he went through this and had this relationship, the confirmation and the maintain the new recipe was carrying this message when he couldn't find the relief from practicing these principles. What created the change was the focus on another human being and carrying this message. That would save the day. So that's the recipe this whole thing is built on. Remember he talked about that? Right? His depression and his thinking nearly drove him back to drink. But what saved the day wasn't working on his triggers, wasn't working on his character defects, was going to find another alcoholic to work with. Right, That's very important of this message that, that we need to get this recipe for longevity. And that's it, right? Go ahead. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can ensure their confidence when others fail. R remember they're very ill. Okay, so stop there. So, did it say carry a message or this message? This message. This was, so that means I'm doing hopefully what was done with me and guiding somebody through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which it contains our program of recovery. Yes, no? And the application of these principles will enable me to find this power. Because what's our problem? We find out really step one is a symptom of, of this problem that we need to get access to to create change. And lack of power is our dilemma to create change. We all know that, right? So now I found a new person to work with. What's my job is to carry this message. Not, my, not sound bites that I hear in meetings or stuff that from treatment centers. Actual this message. So if I'm taking somebody through this... Here's where it starts to tell me when I find somebody to work with, what to do. And we're just going to do a small segment of this to, to, to kind of go into what we're talking about. Why they make a d clear distinction between the obsession and the malady. Right? So I'm working with somebody and on page 92 it tells me, what does it say? Page 92. Tell them how baffled... Top yeah. of the page. Tell them how baffled you were. You finally learned that you were sick. So remember that you terminology. Know? So remember that terminology was used earlier. Where did they use the the idea of baffled? Was on page twenty three when they introduced us to the malady of the problem that centers in the mind of the alcoholic. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism. What is this malady? Right. And on page thirty, it talked about we learned. That we fully had to concede to our inner self. What are we learning? Is what we're going to teach here. This is what we're passing forward. Is the education of what alcoholism is. 
So you hear people say, oh, I did step one before I got here. No, you may have been suffering from step one before you got here. But what you need to learn is what is this thing that there, that makes me an alcoholic or beyond him? Am I like these people that put this thing together? I need to get educated on the facts of alcoholism, on the two symptoms being presented. So in this conversation, they're starting off with the second symptom because usually you found somebody who wants to stop drinking. You don't find people who are still enjoying drinking, do you? No. So... So that means you're talking to somebody who's a little baffled at their inability to stay sober, right? They're not still struggling with the idea of wanting to drink. They don't want to drink anymore and still find themselves drinking. Anybody like that here or know people like that? There's a difference difference because a lot of people come into the fellowship, they have a bit of consequence problems, but they don't like the idea of not drinking again. They're not ready for the idea of stopping. They're finding a way of controlling and enjoying, which is the obsession of every abnormal drinker, right? The idea that somehow we could control and enjoy our drinking. How many people were of that type before they found out about the illness of alcoholism? Definitely. Yeah, because we, we had a consequence problem, not an alcohol problem. Anybody here? It's just the bad combination of things. Like it shouldn't do acid with tequila, bad combination. Right? And meth like I had a combination problem. I didn't have a drinking problem. <laughs> I had ending up in the wrong place problem. Anybody remember the twenty questions? I, I didn't know what they meant by half of that stuff, so I didn't know I was even lying. Well, I wasn't lying because I didn't understand what they said you ever end up in jail as a result of drinking? No. End up in jail because of that fight or because of that situation, <laughs> but not because of drinking. Do you, you ever black out? Don't remember, right? <laughs> I mean, have you ever lost work due to drinking? No, I didn't have a job. So I didn't. So anyways, if you ever drink alone? Why not, right? So anyway, like who don't, right? So so we're a little, ain't, ain't anybody of that type here? If you're asking yeah. me about me, you're not getting the truth, but I don't know I'm not giving you the truth, right? Those 20 questions should be for the people around you. Here. Take this home and get them to fill this out for you. <laughs> All right? Okay. Because <laughs> it's a way different answer than our story. Isn't it? How many people got sober and realized, holy shit, you got a way different experience about you than everybody around you. Right? Two different stories, right? Okay, go ahead. My sister used to leave it open on my bed every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are wonder, you trying to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. wonder how this gets here all the time. Okay. <laughs> what the fuck is this? Uh, how you finally learned you were sick. Give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. To stop. That's the thing is, is what gets our attention is when we want to stop, we find we keep drinking again. But with us, we think we got three months that we did good. Look how good I did the last time. Did you start drinking again? Yeah. Then you didn't do good. But we don't know that. We think, oh, look how successful I was before. Well, if you want before recovery, do what you did before. What did you do before got you loaded? Oh, we don't think about that aspect of it, do we? Anybody? We think, oh, because for us, that's a very successful. I went three months. Where's my chip? Where's my plaque? Can I speak? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Show him the mental twist, which leads to the first drink of a spree. So what are you showing him? The mental mm -hmm. twist that leads to the first of what? A spree. So they talk about that earlier. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in a drinking, right? So here, if the obsession was a part of that, which it isn't, what's the obsession in association with? Let's read it on page 30. So the obsession on page 30 is in association to what? Most of us, go ahead. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we we're real alcoholics. Meaning I have these symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Two symptoms in alcoholism, not three. So the body and the mind. Yep. Right? So if this is more about alcoholism, what are they going to talk more about? More about those two symptoms, are they not? Yes. So from page 30 to 33, they're talking about the allergy. 
right? And it segues into the malady on page 33. That's why it talks about there could be no lurking notion whatsoever that one day we'll be immune to alcohol. That's the conversation they're having here in regards to the physical aspect. Because if you don't get the first symptom down right, the second symptom doesn't matter. Right? Because mm -hmm. if you still think you can drink with immunity, how would that be insanity? Because then you're making the decision to drink. Right? Got it? Yes. So see what they say here, okay? Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. What that translates into is to drink without consequence. That's what it means for people like us. Because my friends drink like me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't hang around with people that don't drink like me. Anybody? Yeah. I, I, those people that don't drink like me, they're the ones with the problem. Right? I find people who drink just like me. Anybody here? Maybe I'm different. Anybody here? And pretty yeah. soon there's nobody that drinks like me, so I drink alone. I think George Thurgood talked about that, right? I understand me and George, man, we go way back, right? Some of the younger people go, who? Anyways, moving on. Right, George? Anyway, so is this person yeah. is this person think they have a problem yet? No. No, they're just they're not good at drinking yet. Because their problem is consequences. There's, there's got to be a way I could drink and still go to work, still not blow the paycheck, still make the child support, still end up with my partner instead of the neighbor. There's got to be a way that I could do these things. And not, not hit on my cousin after five drinks. Like, there's got to be a way I could do this stuff without... Yeah. Oh, some of you have been there, eh? <laughs> okay, just uh, see the laugh. Can't believe you said that out loud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so you get where they're at with this now? Like, this person is not seeking help, are they? But they're talking about the progression maybe of the heavy drinker or the potential alcoholic, right? They haven't really sought help yet because they're still under the idea there's somehow some way they could control and enjoy their drinking yes or no yeah okay the idea that somehow someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker see it doesn't say of the alcoholic does it it says of every abnormal drinker this person may seek help or may not seek help but those who seek help will be directly as a result of consequences. Because I know a lot of people who drink, like my neighbor, he goes to work, he drinks every day from the time he gets up to, there's no consequences. So why would he seek help? How many people here, come on, would still be drinking if you could drink without consequence? So we see the consequence gets our attention. So somewhere along the line, something will start happening in sequence where they go to the first meeting out of embarrassment, shame, or guilt. Anybody? Or they don't know what to say to people around them anymore, and, and they use that card. I'm going to, and then you, you said it. So, oh, my God, I can't believe I said it. So you have to follow through, and you show up to your first meeting like you started some some life sentence or something like that, like a dog being neutered, right? Dragging your nails all the way there. It's kind of, oh, my first meeting. Oh, life's over. <laughs> How many people have been there, right? I don't know what the hell all these people are about. What are they happy about? Life's over. <laughs> Anybody remember that kind of thing? You look around, look at all these losers. What the hell are they looking at? Anybody have that kind of mindset or just me? Yeah. I yeah. know, definitely Katie. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> For a few months. Uh, the idea that... So, oh, I already read that. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. What illusion? Many the illusion of the obsession of the idea that I can drink with impunity. Yes or no? Remember the doctor talked about that? So we see the obsession is in reference to somebody who doesn't think they have a problem yet. They're obsessed with the idea. You hear these, I have the obsession, I want to drink. Because we haven't done step one yet. That's why people are still having the obsession. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Is that what the book's saying? Right? So I need to find out, what do I need to find out in regards to 
the smashing or the taking care or the correcting of this idea that I can drink with impunity. Because right now, I'm not educated on this, am I? If I'm new, am I educated on why I can't drink with impunity? Why I can't drink with other people? Am I going through a bad spell for the last 16 years? Like, is, is like what's going on here? So I really don't know about alcoholism, do I? At this stage. So let's see how they follow that thought up. Go ahead. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. That means a lot of people won't even end up in AA. You're a small percentage of the people who are afflicted with alcoholism. A small percentage makes it into our fellowship. Right? And what gets us here is our drinking gets our attention. Or the people around us does some form of intervention, or we can't live with ourselves anymore. There's a moment of clarity that something's got to change. How many people been there? And now, now AA is more vast. Like, I never knew about AA before my first meeting. I got introduced to AA when I was 16, right? But I never got introduced to the book till I was 27. When I got introduced to the book in 12 Step, the way we're talking here, I've never looked back. Why is that? Because I wasn't educated on alcoholism. I thought it was a behavioral problem. I thought the obsession was the problem. Because what can you do? You can see and feel the obsession, can't you? How many people had that? Yeah, the obsession. For sure. How many people said, I really want to drink, but I don't want to drink, and were able not to drink? Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, we're going to get into the difference there, right? So here we go. We, we learn... Yeah, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. So what are we doing in these big book study workshops? Learning about alcohol. Learning. So on page 92, what is this person doing? The 12 step thing, teaching them about alcoholism. They already know they have a problem, so they're starting with the second symptom. Right? Right? Because these people don't want to drink. Usually people that don't want to drink, again, is the ones that end up in A or court order or get their girlfriend back or a job back or something. But they end up here as a result of driven here under the lash of alcoholism. So, go ahead. Back to the 30. Yep. Um, this is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. Who smashes the idea? We do. We do, based on what? Education. That's why they're going to say, well, let's talk more about it. So they go through this. On page 31, they say, we don't like to pronounce anyone as an alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself in regards to the allergy, the phenomenon of craving. Then 32, they give us an example of somebody who didn't have the malady, but they were able to stay sober for a long period of time because they didn't believe themselves as an alcoholic, but they believed themselves as a problem drinker. And then afterwards, the carpet slippers came out, and they were dead in a short period of time. And then this is this. So page 33 says, if we're planning to stop. Oh, here we go. Once an alcohol, start with that. On page 33, middle of the first paragraph. Yeah, middle of the first paragraph. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we're in short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. So will that take care of the obsession? Uh, yep. Yes, of the idea that I can safely drink. Because what's the yep. obsession in regards to? That I can safely drink without consequence. That alcohol is still a solution to my problem. Yes or no? Yeah. So here is... The idea that I can never safely drink again, would I still have the lurking notion that I can drink? No. So I learned. So I smashed the idea. Listen, I have this allergy. I can't drink with impunity. That explains all the consequences because when I take a drink, it produces the phenomenon of craving. And if I can't control the amounts I drink, there's always going to be consequences in association with my drinking. Do we agree or disagree on that? Agree. Agree. So now they got our attention. So now they're saying, now we're going to talk about the second symptom in alcoholism. Right? Because this is more about alcoholism. And mo most of us have been unwilling to admit we're bodily and mentally different than our fellows. Right? 
Yeah. Yes? So it's now they're going to go to the second part. Why is it that we continue to drink? Isn't that the question? So let's go. Young people. Yeah. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think that they can stop as he did on their own willpower. We doubt if many of them can do it because none of them really want to stop and hardly one of them because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired. So what do they associate that peculiar mental twist in regards to is the malady as first introduced on page 23 as the problem of the alcoholic. So if you go to page 23, like if this is, if you're new to this, it, it, it was kind of like, you, hopefully you could follow along, but you know, it, it's kind of like uh, we're doing a, a summary of this whole thing that you could hopefully bring forward in your development later. So on page 23, this is what they're talking about more on, more and more about alcoholism. So on page 22, they talk about the physical aspect of our drinking, which would be page 30 to 33, right? So let's start there. Perhaps... Uh, bottom of the page, page 22. Perhaps there will never be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We are not sure why, once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do so for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both, both in the bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. Do we agree on that? So when yeah. we take that drink, it triggers the allergy and all hell breaks loose. How many people have experienced that here? Yeah. How many people are never going to do it again and then end up doing it again? So now, you see the conversation. So they're saying there's something happening here beyond the allergy, beyond the physical part of our illness. Because we know, remember Bill? I saw I could not take so much as one drink. Why? Because something different happened in him than other people. So that's what they're getting. They're starting a new conversation here. The experience. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Confirm what? That once we take a drink, we trigger the allergy, right? The phenomenal craving happens, and we go through a well-known stage of a spree. Who told us about that? The doctor did, right? Emerging with a firm resolution not to drink again. But he says there's something that happens in their mind that he didn't really get into. But now they're going to get into the second symptom of alcoholism. So we all agree that if I never took a, another drink, I would never trigger the allergy. But I keep on taking that drink, right? So now they're going to start a new conversation. The second half of more about alcoholism from page 33, and it goes into page 44, talk about the second symptom, an alcoholism. And so what do they say here? Go ahead. What page now? Let's start with this. The experience, page 23. Okay. Page top of 23. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. True. Thereby True. Yeah. We all agreed on that, yeah. right? So there's something else going on with you. Right? If you knew somebody that was allergic to pistachios and they ate them three times after being warned not to, would you think, would they go see a dietitian or a psychiatrist? <laughs> psychiatrist. psychiatrist. But us, how many times, time after time, have we went back to the trough? Anybody here? So the people around us starting to think we're a little nuts. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody really thrilled about your relapses? <laughs> no, so everybody around you is a, quite aware of what a shit show you are, and you're becoming aware of what everybody else already knows, right? Yes, no? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. True, right? Now they're talking about this condition of the mind. Yes or no? It's a new conversation. Because yeah. we all agree, if I never took the drink, I never triggered the allergy. So there's something else going on here. So they go through this, and they talk about here once in a while. Go down. Go ahead. 
Next paragraph. Once in a while, he may tell the truth. And the truth, strange to say, is that usually he has no more idea why he took that first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses which they are satisfied part of the time. So how many people has relapsed here and made an excuse for it? It's because of this or because of that, because of this. So what you're saying is I'm not really beyond human aid. I just had a bad circumstance there. I just got to watch out for these circumstances. Triggers. Uh, so, yeah, triggers. So I'll have circumstantial sobriety. People will go, what happened? The circumstances weren't right. <laughs> right? The circumstances <laughs> are never right. Yeah. Right? Happy, joyous, free, sad, depressed, lonely. Like, we celebrate a drink. We don't even need a reason to take a drink. Anybody here? Any day ending in a Y is a good day to have a drink. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. So they talk about this mind. So go ahead. So they have excuses which they are satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts, they really don't know why they do it. So how many people remember the first time they said they're never going to do it again and did it again? <laughs> Anybody here? How many people has had that experience? So that's what they're talking about now. They're reconfirming this thing that happens in the mind, and they're going to try to explain it in the best way. But in order to do that, they need to label it or put certain terminology to it. That way, when we're discussing it, we'll know what we're talking about in regards to these symptoms that makes one an alcoholic beyond human aid. That's what this guy's doing on page 92. We'll get back to that in a second. But we need to look at where this idea comes from that the symptom, the second symptom in alcoholism is not the obsession, it's the malady. Where does that idea come from? It comes from the book. What does the book say? It says, once this malady has a real hold, they are a baffled lot. Why are they baffled? Because they can't stay stopped. Once this malady that centers where? In the mind. So they're going to expand on that. Remember when they introduced us to the allergy, right? They said these allergic times. Then they said the phenomenon of craving, right? Can't take it. They used a whole bunch of terminology to expand on that idea. These allergic types. And, but the, the symptom, first symptom in alcoholism is what? The yeah. allergy. So when we say, you know, the phenomenon of craving, these allergic, so right? So we realize that happens after we haven't gone through that. Okay, go ahead. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game. So hold on. But this is where people think, oh, that they can drink again. No, we already made the decision earlier. They already said that's not the problem anymore. These people don't want to drink. So what game are they hoping to beat? Not taking not the first drink. That they could be there. How many people has tried to be their own solution here? Exert their will. I'm never drinking again. And then I'm <laughs> drinking again. How many people are, were obsessed with sobriety here? Obsessed. That's the obsession. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Boy, I got look at Look at my list of things I'm doing to keep me sober. I'm obsessed. And he, listen to any newcomer. Especially with court coming. Like, I mean, like, it's just like <laughs> our family visit. So, we'll beat the game. Will be the game of what? Of not taking that first drink. That's what they're talking about. Are they not? Mm -hmm. How many people agree that's what they're talking about? Okay, how many people been there? Okay, so let's follow that line of thinking. Like the book isn't designed as a, to, to bring you along and then all of a sudden introduce you to a new idea out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. It's a textbook. It, it kind of builds on itself. Does that kind of make sense? So... Let's see what it says. Go ahead. It says, there's the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. Why? Baffled. Yeah. Baffled yeah. that I keep drinking against my will. See how it follows that thought there? They often suspect they are down for the count, right? Mm -hmm. Now see what it says to build on that idea. Now we're going to build on that idea. Right? Go ahead. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal. But everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. To do what? To not drink. To not drink. And you hear these people, and that's why it's confusing, because you hear these people in AA, big, huge roundup speakers. We stay sober no matter what. We don't drink no matter what. Under any and all conditions, they give you the impression that you should be able to keep yourself sober. 
Anybody yeah. under that impression? We don't drink no matter what. And then you're sitting there going, oh, shit. I seem to drink no matter what. <laughs> All right? What the hell? <laughs> Pocket full of chips and I'm drinking. Anybody? Yeah. Baffled. Baffled. <laughs> I just get a three-month chip only to get another 24-hour chip. 11 years of that. <laughs> But this time is going to be different. Well, I was lying all those other times, but this time I mean it. I didn't know about alcoholism, so it would make sense that I'd be able to exert my will. Living in meetings, 360 meetings in 90 days, two years of living in AA out here in Vancouver. What got me here from 87 to 89. My last relapse, two, uh, 360 meetings plus. Got a got a three month chip and I was drinking an hour later. Why? Baffled, this condition. So when they started, this guy who ex explained it to me the way the guy's doing on page ninety two got my attention, because I can't see, feel, and touch this thing. What makes you say that? Well, let's continue reading. Uh, but everybody, hopefully, waits the day the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. The tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. So, what classifies somebody as a real alcoholic then? Is Both it the allergy, them. or is it this condition of the malady that centers in the mind? It's the malady. Or is it Both. the obsession? No. It's the allergy with the malady that places us beyond the human aid. Because mm -hmm. these people don't want to drink and they keep on drinking. And a lot of people in the fellowship don't understand that because they made a decision not to drink and they don't drink anymore. Right? And, they, they, and we go to meetings coming back and thanks for doing research for them. They say ignorant comments because they don't understand alcoholism. They don't realize we're still dying of alcoholism. That AA is designed for relapsers. It's not designed for people who can stay sober. Right? Because if you can stay sober... I won't say it. <laughs> okay, well, right? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the tragic truth is the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost control. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. So that means look back on your drinking history. How many times did you go back drinking when you said you'd never do it again? The first time mm -hmm. I was 15, standing on the 18th story of a building, thinking about offing myself, if I had to live the rest of my life like this, we don't got enough time to get into my story, but you can imagine what story I had at 15, thinking if I had to live the rest of my life like this. My first meeting, I was 16. And then dying of alcoholism in all places, NAA. <laughs> right? <laughs> Until somebody twelfth at me the way we're going to re, uh, revisit here in the back. What I was trying to get sober was on sound bites. What pe the general uh, consensus was in the fellowship trying to adopt those ideas in my life by exerting my will. Not understanding it, it was a losing proposition because I had this characteristic that they talk about here. Looking back over my drinking history, how many times was my life going fantastic? And then I just found myself on a two-day drunk. How many times did I find myself with a drink in my hand wondering what happened? And I was living a great life. Just got promoted. New girlfriend. Life's going fantastic. Not a cloud on her horizon. And then there I am drinking again. Just baffled. Anybody like that here? Yeah. So if I have that characteristic, now, I, now there seems to be a problem happening, right? And so that's what they're saying here. Go ahead. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most power powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. This tragic situation has already arrived in pract practically every case long before it is suspected. So what they're saying here, we're telling you about this. Now you're looking back and realize this has been going on a long time. I'm admitting to this thing because you're explaining to me what it looks like. When I look at, when I hold it up against my life, I go, holy shit, this has been going on from the first time I drank against my will here when I was 16. And my life's going, geez, and it continued how many times, time after time after time. And a lot of people are fortunate enough nowadays, they come into the fellowship, they get 12 step, they find a spiritual basis of living, they go through this book, and they don't have to have that experience in any. But most people seem to continuously have this 
experience in AA because they don't have it. It's poor sponsorship. I don't know how else to say that. So all those other people were very helpful to me, but they didn't give me the recipe necessary to, for me to engage in the participation of the saving of my own life. Right? So what happens is they didn't carry this message, they carried a message, a version what that made sense to them, right? By adopting other books, other ideas, other philosophies, other this, other that. And what happens is it doesn't work for people like us. Remember, they talked about, the doctor talked about that in his facility. His methods seemed to work for a lot of people, but they didn't seem to work for this particular type. What particular type? Bill's type. The real alcoholic, the, the scope of, of, of treating these people were outside his realm, right? They were heartbreaking. But upon his third visit, well, his, his third time going to treatment, he acquired certain ideas that he put into practice, which is our program of recovery that we put in a textbook where it wouldn't get changed. That's why they talk about rarely have we seen a person fail the introduction to this first forward to the first edition. We have Alcoholics Anonymous for more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely, precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this. So that's not room for interpretation of this thing means that thing or, or you can interchange the meanings of this thing. Precisely means precisely. They thought of the wording and how they presented this thing to those who are still yet to come here. They all agreed on it. Right? It's not, what was that word I used earlier? It's not, uh, this means the same thing. It's all semantics. It's not semantics. <laughs> right? It's not semantics. If your life depends on something, on this thing, how many people would like to know the difference between a life jacket and a sink? Yeah. So who's ever throwing stuff overboard, hopefully something's going to float. <laughs> hopefully a life jacket, right? Here, try this. <laughs> nope, that didn't work. Oh, shit, we lost another one. <laughs> try the lifeguard comes by. Hey, these things on the throw them one of those things. And why is there a rope tied to it? So they can reel them back in. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> the fact. Okay. Important stuff, italics. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We're unable at certain times. At certain We're times, not all the time. So they need to explain that because we look at it and go, what do you mean? I said no to a drink three times last week. Last week <laughs> yeah. I really wanted the drink and I went to a meeting and I was able to override that idea. Or the thought was, I'm going through a lot of pain, and man, I would really like a drink. How many people have been there? But you smash the idea because based on the truth of the learning that you did here, right? And then what happens? You get busy with another person right away because you know you're in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Is that the same as the malady? Is the upset, the idea of wanting to have a drink the same as the malady? No. Two different things. So when a malady happens, what confirms it's the malady? You're drinking again. Yeah. But when you have the thought or the idea, you're able to smash curb or get some help or apply spiritual principles to override that. In the last 32 years, you know how many different times I thought, man, a drink would be really good now? A couple mm -hmm. times. Because I really enjoy drinking. I did. Yeah. I like I like good and drunk, drooling drunk. Maybe I'm the only one here. Like good and drunk, where you got to talk to your feet, left, right, <laughs> left. Like I like that kind of drunk. Anybody here? Maybe yeah. nobody. I like that kind of drunk, where where you're having a party all by yourself. You're talking to the stereo, and it's like it's you, and they're like you know, <laughs> reliving the past all by yourself. I like that kind of shit. What I don't like is the jail cell in the morning. <laughs> or yeah. the hospitals, the beatings. I don't like the consequences or my liver sticking out of my side and turning a little jaundice at 27 seven years old. <laughs> Yellow eyes, still thinking I'm yeah. all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Vision Looking for you. Like yeah, That's would what you, I look like. Yeah, would you like my number? <laughs> so anyways, so, so now when we go over to page 33... So they, 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 this idea of squiggly writing, they're going to expand on it more about alcoholism. So on page 33, they talk about here this twist. And then on 35, right? 
they, they go into the introduction here. So I'll, I'll hit the highlights. 34, as we look back, right? So they say, here's the symptom. Now look back. Do you exhibit it? And then they start going yeah. through, right? The tremendous fact for every one of us, the, the impossibility of stopping, right? So the, the step one promise is we're going to drink again. That's what step one is we're agreeing to is I'm going to drink again. If you're powerless over something, that means it has you. You don't have it. Right? So step yeah. one says, this is my fate unless something different happens. So in 35, there, what's the wording there? Top of the page. So we shall describe? Yeah. Uh, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. For obviously, this is the crux of the problem. So they're going to expand on what symptom? The malady that centers where? In the mind. They're calling this the crux of the problem. So they're going to give us examples what that looks like for people who exhibit this. And nowhere in our book do they use the obsession as a part of that because these people don't want to drink anymore. If you still want to drink, you haven't done step one or understand alcoholism or it doesn't apply to you. So when you hear people in the meeting go, I, I so want to drink, then they need to be 12 step and educated through this process. What they're saying is I need a sponsor because a part of my brain hasn't found a solution sufficient enough for me to be comfortable in my own skin. And my brain's thinking it's a good idea. It's different than the insanity. That's what they're getting at here. So the insanity, they they go through this thing. On page 37, they explain the, the synopsis or the overall conclusion of the best way to explain this condition that places the alcoholic beyond human aid. What alcoholic? They talk about here on page 34. I'm going to back up then. So what they're trying to do here at the bottom of page 34, before they go into page 35, what do they say here at the bottom? How then? Yeah. How then shall we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us? Whether they are one of who? Everybody that went before us. Mm -hmm. Remember here the, when they started the fifth, uh, fourth edition? Here are thousands of men and women who have recovered. That means we have a consensus or we have a collective understanding of what the problem is, the solution, and the course of action. We have a collective experience, not only with alcoholism, but with the recovery process and what the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous looks like in our lives. This is our new story. What story do we have? We have the story of Alcoholics Anonymous because we could have never created this story, right? So they're saying, hey, how shall we determine to the reader whether you're one of us? So now they go into that question, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse of drinking. That determines whether you're one of us. If you're one of us, then you're beyond human aid. The people that put this together were beyond human aid. They weren't able to stop on their own resources. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yeah. Right? So this is a synopsis on page 37 of the whole summary of step one. Go ahead. You may think. Sorry, what? Where are we right now? Yeah, go, okay. go. Whatever the precise definition of the word may be, go ahead and start with it. Okay, this guy whatever, just put it. This guy does. Seven. Yeah, sorry. This guy doesn't want to drink, and he just put an ounce of whiskey in his milk. Okay, page right? thirty-seven. Whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? Oh, God, don't leave us on the hook now. Keep reading. <laughs> you may you may think this is an extreme case. Yeah, most of, the, most of us go, I'd never put an ounce of whiskey in my, my milk. That's crazy. They're giving us an example. Well, what did you do before you relapsed the last time? Were you able to stop yourself? The last, how many people remember their last relapse? Yeah. How many people remember their last relapse? Just before you picked up that drink, what could you have done differently? Most people go, call my sponsor, go to a meeting. If you think that, then you, don't un you haven't done step one yet. If you said, there's nothing I could have done because that's a summary of the illness that I'm suffering from because I didn't find a sufficient enough solution to bring about a psychic change of spiritual experience. So that's the conclusion of step one is I'm going to drink again. And that drink was confirmation of step one. Yeah. That's what taking that drink is. If I could have done anything then I'm not beyond human aid. But if there's nothing I could have done, now I'm in trouble because that means it's going to happen again. So that's why you need to honestly look back over your life. 
why are you able to stop yourself from drinking? And the answer is no, because if it was yes, you would have never took that drink based on your past experience with it. Yes or no? Yeah. Totally. Anybody's relapses here getting better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How many people remember their last relapses? Oh my God, that was a great exercise. Can't wait to do that again. <laughs> See, you know, most of us are usually running from a building on fire. Ah! <laughs> All right. After uh, some of our relapses. Anyways, that's why we apply. when you come back, people look at you and go, Oh my God. Like, good to see you. That one's mine. We draw straws on some of you. No one else wanted Katie, so I had to sponsor her, but that's another story. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you may think this is an extreme case, but to us it is not far-fetched. For this kind of thinking has been characteristic of every single one of us. Every single one of us, not some of us. What, this malady, this condition that centers in this mind, right? And now they're going to describe what it is. What What is the characteristic of every single one of us? Of what? Of those of us who are like this. So how shall we help our readers to determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us, right? And this is the characteristic of every single one of us. Not some of us, every single one of us. And those who don't have this characteristic don't understand it. They, and we'll get into that in a second. Go ahead. That's why there's a big difference in the fellowship. Those understand the obsession, but very few people understand the malady, this characteristic, because... You know why we like the obsession? Because we can do something about it. Yeah. That doesn't place me beyond human aid. This does. Now I'm in trouble. Nobody likes to think they're bodily and mentally different than their fellows. Mm. We had to concede to our innermost selves. Not admit that we have a problem. Concede to what? These ideas that are being presented. And here go. Go ahead. We have sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences. But there was always the curious mental phenomenon that that parallel with our sound reasoning. There mental phenomenon. Sense. They call this characteristic in our mind, this malady, a phenomena. Yeah. An unexplainable event that happens to us. Try to explain your thinking to a normal person. I explained, my, like my wife says, you went in and out for 11 years. I said, yeah. She says, you what? You, let, you got stabbed, left the hospital, and you went right to the liquor store? I said, yeah, I nearly missed it too. It was a long weekend. And she was, she was kind of nervous. Like I told her this after we were married for a while. Of course, she's a normie, right? She looked a little hard. She goes, you're going to stick with AA, right? I said, yeah, I'm going to stick with AA. She, I told her so. She goes, I don't want to hear about your past. She goes, I'm in love with you, not your past. She says, I, she says, I would have walked right by that guy. I said, I would have probably said something lewd. <laughs> but she's a phenomenal woman. Right? She loves. So when we go to Ronda, when I speak around everyone, she come, there's the, the talk I have when she's there, and there's the talk I have when she's not there. <laughs> Smart man. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Phenomena. Uh there, yeah, phenomena that parallel with our sound reasoning. There inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. Okay, so we've gone through this, and now they're going to end the chapter by talking more about this symptom and saying this, this the summary, the conclusion of the second symptom of the condition that places us behind human aid, what makes us powerless over alcohol, which is step one. The confirmation of step one is 43. Go ahead. Once more, in case, you, in case you missed it, in case you missed it in the 43 pages we've been explaining it to you, yeah. the forwards, the, right, the preface, yeah. the doctor's opinion, in case you missed it, right? Let's, <laughs> let's clarify this one more time, right? Bottom paragraph, last paragraph of the chapter. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. And this is my truth. In 32 years, that's happened to me a couple times in sobriety. The only thing that stood between me and a drink was my relationship with a power greater than myself. And I was dumbfounded. I don't got enough time to get into those things. But I was alarmed by how close I was to having a drink. Or something happening and something snapped me out of that situation where I was never able to get past those before in my life, right? That intervention came on a spiritual level. And I've met thousands of people in A who have had the same experience. Something intervened at a certain moment 
that change their course of, of life. I wouldn't go test that. Okay, God, <laughs> that's not what they're talking about. So let's go back to page 92, and we're going to finish this thing now. So, so do we get a clear distinction between the terminology of the obsession in the book and the malady? Yeah. Yes, no? So now, you know, whatever you want to, whatever terminology you want to use is fine, but the book is very clear. So, let's start. We got a couple minutes now. Give them a go ahead from the top, please. Tell them, <clears throat> 92? Yep. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggles you made to, sh to stop. Show him the mental twist, which leads to the first drink of drinking of, of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. Yes, see if, what they use. So have they used the word obsession in regards to explaining our, our problem? No. No. So now you're working with a new person and are they asking you to explain the obsession. Because it's not one of the conditions that make us alcoholic. Most people we're working with don't want to drink anymore and they want to know why they keep on drinking. Mm. Anybody like that here? Because I tried to stop. I promised my kids I'd stop. I promised my employers I have everything going for me. Why do I do it again? Anybody here? Yep. So this person wants to know why do I keep on doing this? And there's probably snot running from their nose. And their, remember, anybody remember that place? Anybody remember that place of just that hopeless feature of embarrassing, impending doom, where your head feels like it's going to cave through your chest and you got a hole in your stomach of the shame, guilt? Remember that? Remember that? Last for about two weeks, right? And then it wasn't that bad. <laughs> That wasn't that bad. Anybody looking for a sponsor? Hi, what's your name, sister? Yeah, I can help you through the steps. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I need help. Pray for me. Okay, go ahead. We do. We suggest you do this, as we have done in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is alcoholic, he will understand you at once. Yeah. He will match. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. Anybody? Remember times they drank against their will? They said they're never going to do it again and found themselves drinking again? That they were sober two years, three months, six months, doing fantastic, and then celebrated with another 24-hour chip? Yep. How many people here? And a couple people not, a couple people in Al-Anon not agreeing? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, it says, where, sorry. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. If you are satisfied he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. Of the malady, which would be what? Some of the mental states that proceed to relapse into drinking. That were an hour when I was at that meeting getting a three-month chip, getting Academy Award, that I was never drinking again. An hour later, I'm drinking again, baffled. Well, when did you realize you were drinking? When I was watching the bubbles come out of the beer, thinking, man, you nice fluffy clouds. <laughs> April 8th was the last time. Baffled. How many times did I have a drink then after? After my brain says, you're not supposed to be doing this. How many people have that brain that tells them after? Where your brain's get, hey, you're not supposed to be doing this. Yeah. Honestly, how many people have that type of thinking here? Mm -hmm. That's what places you beyond human aid. Why didn't that shit tell you before that? Forgot. <laughs> Forgot. <laughs> remember, we can't remember. Remember? <laughs> oh, now I remember. <laughs> okay, <go. laughs> Waiter. <laughs> what are you working on, sir? Another 24 hour chip? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Show him from your own experience how the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he has seen it and wishes to discuss it. And be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw to his own conclusion. If he sticks to the idea that he can still control his drinking... See that? The see that? <laughs> if he sticks to that he can control his drinking, he's not convinced that he really has a problem. He has a consequence from him. There's got to be... He's still obsessed with the idea that he can control and manage his drinking. And some people can I know a lot of people who came to AA who are drinking, who are able to drink. They had problems or heroin addicts and, and without getting in. I see them. They, I know them still. They, they, as long as they don't do their drug of choice, they could have a drink or something every now and then. 
I can't drink alcohol in any form whatsoever, no matter what. I can't really do anything successfully. Anybody here? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I don't even do near beer. Like what would be the point? That's like snorting baby powder. What's the point? I like the effect. <laughs> like just stay away from that shit. If your mind's saying it's okay to drink near beer, you, you haven't really done step one yet. That's the last thing I'm saying on that. Go ahead. Um, if he still thinks he can control his drinking, tell him that possibly he can yeah. if he is not too alcoholic. <laughs> but insist that if he is severely afflicted, there may be little chance he can recover by himself. Continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. So you hear people say, oh, Bill didn't, Bill didn't like to use the same word. Ever hear people say that? Yeah. Well, he's using the same word over and over here. Malady seems to be most consistent word when explaining the second symptom of alcoholism that places us beyond human aid. They're very specific about this. Right? Go ahead. Continue to speak of, as a fatal malady. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. A fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of the body and mind. How many symptoms are there in alcoholism? Two, not three. We get the idea of three coming from treatment centers. That's not um, our understanding, collective understanding of what makes one an alcoholic. The spiritual malady that does not make one an alcoholic, and it's not associated with alcoholism. It's association with resentments. Go ahead. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. So it's never realize. So what we're doing is getting educated. And once you're educated, you can never be the same again. Because <laughs> after a couple of years, you think maybe those AAs were right. Right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Last part. Doctors are, are rightly loath to tell, an al tell alcoholic patients the whole story unless it'll serve some good purpose. But you may talk to him about the hopelessness of alcoholism because you offer a solution. You will soon have your friend admitting he has many, if not all, the traits of the alcoholic. If his own doctor is willing to tell him that he is alcoholic, so much the better. Even though your protege may, may not have entirely admitted his condition, he has become very curious to know <laughs> Very curious. Uh, uh, so they don't use sponsor, sponsor, they use protege. Yeah. Right, and carrying this message. So I, I hope uh, that helps some people out tonight. But I remember when I went through them, my sponsor, it, it cleared up a lot of things for me. And I started uh, adopting my, uh, carrying this message to these ideas. Right, so I, I really uh, enjoyed tonight. Anybody else enjoyed tonight? It was, hopefully it was good for those that participated. Awesome. Rob, thank you, Katie. Scott, You're awesome. Uh, Katie, thank you very much for all your service. The seventh tradition states that Alcoholics Anonymous is self-supporting through our own contributions. The contributions help to cover the group's expenses, but the seventh tradition is more than simply paying for rent and other group expenses. It is both a privilege and a responsibility of the individual groups and members to ensure that our organization at every level remains forever self-supporting and free from outside influences that might divert us from our primary purpose. The Keystone Group has been in operation for a year now. Uh, in that time, all of the money that we take in, other than for a prudent reserve, is sent to GSO in New York in order to keep them going at a difficult time. Uh, the information, if you want to give to... Uh, to GSO, I'll make sure that it gets to them. Um, the information, our PayPal account is in the chat. So give if you can, we'd appreciate it. Uh, also, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to YouTube, type in, in the search field, Tony R. Vancouver. Uh, there are over 80 talks on there. It's a great resource to uh, update you or if there's something that uh, you're, you're missing or you're questioning. Go and check out those talks because they are an incredible resource. Uh, also, after this meeting, Tony will take questions. So if you have any questions, raise your hand function. Uh, once I finish, I've only got a couple more things to go through. Uh, we have big book worksheets. They, uh, are, and we also have worksheet workshops. Uh, Art runs those. One is on Saturday night at 8 Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. And the other one is on Monday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern and 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. 
Uh, if you want to have a lot of fun and go through the workshops and learn, uh, it's a great resource also. Also, we have a Facebook group. It's called the Big Book Step Study Discussion Group. That information is in the chat. Join um, our Facebook group. That way you will be able to get the Big Book Worksheets. They are there. Also, it will let you know when uh, the meetings are happening. Because the Keystone group has 16 meetings a week. So uh, we have the ladies only meeting on Friday night. And uh, the, all the rest of them are lined by. And, and uh, Joe's or, is live and wrong on Sundays. That's right. On Sunday at 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Joe C. Um, if you, it's an incredible meeting. Uh, as are all of them, to be honest with you. Uh, Tony, have I missed anything? No, ju just just the serenity prayer. Okay, so in the chat mm -hmm. is all the information that you will need for the PayPal, mm -hmm. the meetings, uh, big book worksheets, etc. And now with uh, we'll close up with the serenity prayer. Tony, what do we need for a good meeting? God. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, uh, everybody. Don't forget, Tony, I'll take questions, so uh, raise your hand.